Hi, everybody. Welcome today. Uh, my name is Patrick Lowry. I'm just one of the organizers for this conference. One of the nice things that when you help organize a conference is you get to be a little bit selfish and you get to pick and choose what you want. Uh, one of the fun things that I got to do was to work on the keynote committee, which that meant I get to pick who I wanted. Um, so if you have other people that you want in the future, join us and you can join these committees and you can get who you want. Um, in, in my job, I do incident response for a local company here and we are often battling all the extremes of the attackers on the internet um, and you can imagine what all of those extremes are. So I'm trying to get as much information as I can about uh, those people. Uh, so one of the sources of research that I fell into was a researcher called Gabriella Coleman, uh, who's written a few books on Anonymous uh, in her research uh, on that part of the internet. And as I was going through and reading Gabriella's books, uh, sometimes you can also see the suggestions and it's like, oh, if you like that book, you should also read this one. So based on that, I kind of picked up a few of those and started reading. And then I came across this one that I really liked. And I went through it and decided, that's a person that we should get for a keynote. So the book is The Coming Swarm, and it's authored by our keynote, Molly Sauter. And we're going to actually have a, a book signing right after this, right outside. Uh, we're just going to uh, going to charge $15 for the book because we have to pay for them, and Molly will sign it for you. So if that's something you want, we we'll certainly welcome everybody to come out. As you face the table, line up to the right, so that way when you get your book, you'll go right into the food. Because that's the other great news, right after this you get food. <laughs> All right. So based on that, I also have the official introduction here, which I need my glasses for since I'm getting old. Uh, so, Molly Sauter is a doctoral student at McGill University in Montreal in the Department of Art History and Communication Studies. She holds a master's degree in Comparative Media Studies from MIT and is an affiliate researcher at the Center for Civic Media at the MIT Media Lab and the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Her research is situated in the socio-political analyses of, technological, of te technology and technological culture and is broadly focused on hacker culture, transgressive digital activism, and depictions of technology in the media. Her work has been published in The Atlantic, High Low Brow, IO9, and The American Behavioral Scientist in the MIT Technology Review. Her research has been featured in the, in, by uh, Popular Mechanics, Boing Boing, the BBC, NPR, the CBC, Der Spiegel, Salon, and Christian Science Monitor. She's the author of The Coming Swarm. Uh, DDoS actions, hacktivism, civil disobedience on the internet. She resides in Montreal, Quebec, and lives on the internet blogging at oddletters.com and tweeting at oddletters. So can you please give a warm welcome for Molly Sauter. Hi guys, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I really enjoy coming and talking to InfoSec audiences because I don't have to explain how things work. We don't have to do the raise your hand if you know what a DDoS is, and then no one raises their hand, and then I have a sad. <laughs> so my name is Molly. I study technological activism, and particularly disruptive technological activism. So I wrote my master's thesis at MIT on DDoS as its history as a tool of activism, and how it's used and misused and has been used for about 20, 25 years at this point. So probably more like 30 years at this point. I'm particularly interested in activism that occurs outside the mainstream. So something that, you know, to be quite honest, is probably just making your jobs harder, but which has a very valuable place in democracy. So I wrote this book. You can buy it after this talk if you would like. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the research in this book in this talk. Instead, what I want to talk about is part of this, what I talk about in this book, is how the internet is a privately owned public space. And you might be familiar with the concept of a privately owned public space from Occupy Wall Street. This is an image of Zuccotti Park shortly after it was cleared of protesters from the first Occupy Wall Street encampment. You can see how everyone is gathered around it. There are lots of people with official looking high visibility vests inside and a nice row of riot cops right here. So Zuccotti Park is not a park in the way that Central Park is a park. Central Park is public. Central Park is organized and controlled and subject to restrictions about rights and restrictions of those rights that Zuccotti Park isn't, because Zuccotti Park is a privately owned public space, which is sort of a new type of space that we started really getting into with you know, the sort of collapse of public infrastructure in the US. 
what it is is it's owned by a coalition of finance firms and they get a certain set of breaks from the New York City government in order to maintain it as like a nice open area where people can go eat lunch or when people can go and hang out during the day. But when Occupy Wall Street moved in, under the assumption that this is a public park, we have free speech rights in a public park, we can engage in activism in a public park, that's when we had this collision of private property rights and the assumption of public property rights. So something that I'm really interested in is how we get to this space where we think we have a set of rights in various spaces, but instead we don't. We've managed to sort of give away those rights, particularly on the internet, through TOSs, click wrap agreements, and other quote unquote contracts of adhesion that dominate the legal relationships between people and the private entities that control those spaces. So one of the major arguments that I have in my book is that the internet is not a public space. We like to think that the internet is a public space because it appears to us in the guise of a public space, but it is in fact basically entirely privately owned. So the rights that you have on the sidewalk, in a public park, even like in a town square, you don't have those. You have the rights you have in a mall. You don't have a lot of rights in a mall. You can't stand in the corner of a mall and hand out leaflets. There was a Supreme Court case about this. You can't stand in an airport and hand out leaflets. This is why that, how many people have seen Airplane? The movie Airplane, you know that joke word with all the Hare Krishnas and the flowers and how no one gets that anymore? Because it's like, that's not what an airport, an airport is like. It's what an airport used to be like, but not anymore since that Supreme Court case that happened that one time. So, and this is even before we get to Lessig's style, code is law. So, the online space is controlled through these contracts of adhesion, but then also an additional level through the actual construction of it. And this is something that you guys are all familiar with. You can construct a system, you can construct a site, you can construct a collection of technologies that don't even act like certain rights exist. This simply is not the assumption of those rights. And this, this book by Larry Lessig is an excellent sort of example of just explaining that concept. So what I want to talk about in this talk is how policing in these spaces is achieved. How are we policing the internet? What is happening with the collection of, and we fixed that. Uh, how are we policing the space through a collection of regulation, law, practice, code, and how is that, how is that working? And what is the role of private corporate information security practitioners like yourselves in fulfilling that role. But first I want to talk about cowboys and cattle wrestling in the American West in the late 1800s <laughs> for reasons. So in the American West in the late 1800s, law and order was a really rare thing. We've all seen Tombstone and various awesome films like that. Imagine that, but actually worse. So we're lacking a at that time, we lacked even an overarching federal agency to enforce law and order. And so instead, we had local municipalities enforcing law in an ad hoc fashion, relying on vigilantism and community-based responses to, inform local, to enforce local norms of property and social values. So in 1879, we have the cattle industry in the American West undergo a series of rapid expansions. So before you had people with small herds moving into territories and, and baby states, essentially. And when you hit 1879, suddenly all of those people start coalescing their wealth and their influence. And you have what are called cattle barons emerge. And cattle barons are people, this is exactly what they sound like. They own huge heads of cattle, huge amounts of cattle, and they dominate the landscape with these, with, with their, with what they're doing. And these cattle barons often got into fights with small farmers, sheep herders, over water rights, grazing rights, and even the ownership of cattle, where we get cattle rustling from. Some of these conflicts were actually extraordinarily bloody, and they're called the Range Wars, if you're interested in this part of American history, or Zane Gray's novel of, of the same title. In these conflicts, local governments were actually often more sympathetic to small owners and farmers. Local law enforcement was often reluctant to investigate claims of cattle rustling, which usually happened when a hired hand would either make off with a few head of cattle or even have cattle of his own that was then claimed by a cattle baron 
So local investigators were really not that interested in sort of burning bridges with people who lived in their town. They would often just not investigate. And the federal government was unable to effectively extend its reach to enforce growing corporate norms of ownership and power control and capital dominance. So this left the cattle barons, who had a lot of wealth and power, searching for a different way to defend their property, their interests, and their investments. And they came together in what are called cattlemen associations, which still exist now, consolidating their power and influence together into large bodies. These organizations, they internally fixed the price of beef to be high. They would fix the wages of cowhands to be low. They would limit competition and influence the passage of laws privileging association members over other farmers and ranchers. So there were a number of laws passed in a couple of territories that said, if you had cattle that weren't branded, they belonged to the Cattlemen Association. They were just, congratulations, these aren't yours anymore. Or if you had cattle that were branded with a brand that was not part of the Cattlemen Association, they were also not yours anymore. And ultimately, they hired private police to enforce their prerogatives throughout a given territory. And the biggest agency of this kind at the time was the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And it was one of the major providers of private policing forces in the American West in the late 1800s. It had 2,000 active agents and 30,000 reserve agents, and it was larger than the U.S. Standing Army at the time. So throughout the American West, private detectives were hired directly by cattlemen associations or subcontracted through agencies like the Pinkertons to enforce, to sit, to act, they would sit at crossroads and they would also sit at cattle markets to confiscate rustled cattle. So they would actually come into places where cattle were being traded and claim rustled cattle from people who they claimed had stolen them. Or cattle that were bearing association brands that weren't recognized. They were often empowered to make arrests. In some territories, like Montana, they were empowered to make arrests without warrants. Um, and they often conducted surveillance, following people who they believed were engaged in fence cutting or cattle wrestling across state lines. Fence cutting in the American West at this time was a huge deal because it had to do with water rights and the ability of cattle barons to graze cattle over large tracts of land that could otherwise be used for farming. So what we have here is the appearance in the American West of influential associations possessed of influence to turn their private regulations into actual law and then also helping themselves to a portion of the state's monopoly on force, so the Hobbesian state monopoly on force, by hiring and contracting out their own private policing forces to enforce those norms and regulations across a broad geographic space. Private detective agencies like the Pinkertons operated according to the values and priorities of the corporations and associations that hired them, while a publicly funded, publicly accountable, reactive police force may have had the goal of keeping the peace, quote unquote, a privately funded, proactive policing force like these private detective agencies deployed by cattlemen's associations at the turn of the century had a clear and manifest goal of maintaining profitability. So Molly, what does this have to do with the internet? <laughs> That's a great question. So this, I love stock photography. <laughs> And th I found this by looking for internet justice. <laughs> it's great. So we have yet to hit upon a cohesive, effective, trans-jurisdictional model for policing on the internet. We have yet to really even settle upon a general body of laws that should be in place, let alone establishing actual bodies and methodologies of effective enforcement. But Business is still being transacted online. The web is still one of the richest places in, like, in the modern world in terms of potential profit making. Policing is obviously happening because you can't have a marketplace the size of the internet without having some sort of legal and norms enforcement. So, but how is it happening? So as in the American West, policing has defaulted to those enemies that have the biggest investment in the space and the capital on hand to defend those investments which are commercial corporations. The security apparatus of the current internet is constructed and maintained to specifications of corporate actors and to protect and maximize their potential profits. Companies and businesses attempt to control their users' behavior through social control, so terms of service, contracts of adhesion, and also the code structure of their products. They also, if we remember the early internet, we had 
the armies of AOL moderators who would literally sit in chat rooms and if you said something mean would be like, now you are kick banned. And so that was another form of social control. When these fail, hackers, activists, bored teenagers, and other quote unquote bad actors can succeed in utilizing the available technology in a way that damages prof profitability. The, and these users are then often removed from the platform, sometimes with a little warning or explanation, despite whatever investment they may have built up personally within that particular internet fiefdom. Sometimes these are for social or moral infractions, like posting pictures of breastfeeding on Instagram, or claiming a name that doesn't follow the typical Anglo-European format of given, given name family name on Google+. Sometimes there isn't a clear reason and there isn't really a requirement to be. If you actually sit down and read the 40-page TOS you signed when you got your Facebook account, they don't need a reason. They just have to not like you that day. Sometimes you're forced to abandon the platform because the graphic rape and death threats and doxes you receive every day aren't recognized by the platform as threatening speech, despite the fact that they've caused you to flee your home out of fear for your safety. The validity of behavior is determined not by how negative it is affecting users necessarily, but how negatively it is impacting a company's bottom line. So, and I, I looked up rights, and I don't know if this is a real Peanuts cartoon, but I really hope it is, because it's kind of amazing. So in a democratic republic like the United States, individuals have rights to protect us against the abuses and oversteps of our government. We do not have such rights in dealing with corporations. Theoretically, this is why we have civil courts. So that if we are wronged by a non-government actor, we can pursue redress through the mechanism of a personal suit, a civil suit, or a class action lawsuit in civil courts. But in the age of click wrap, contracts of adhesion, and TOSs running to 40 pages or more for an iTunes update, we have signed away many of those rights under binding arbitration clauses and agreements not to join class action lawsuits. I highly recommend everyone read the contract you signed when you got your credit cards. It's really shocking. You basically can't do anything. Um, so we've traded away all of our avenues of redress for free email and kind of awesome cat gifts. <laughs> so I don't need to tell you guys how central the internet is to everyday life. This is a picture from a recent New York Times article of two of the major organizers of the protests in Ferguson and Baltimore and the Black Lives Matter protests. I highly recommend the article if you're interested in this type of thing. As political and social movements push beyond the local to be truly national and transnational, the internet is a central space of organizing and debate, and sometimes even the setting of actions themselves, as in the case with DDoS actions, but also in the case with email campaigns, petitions, things that we more traditionally recognize as valid activism. While the online space provides affordances to help activists leap over the bounds of time and space and organize these very amazing actions, they are doing so in an environment that cares nothing for their rights of speech, assembly, or privacy. Like it or not, I might just cut out. Uh, I can just shout the rest of this. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was saying was so controversial. <laughs> Which terms of service did you violate? I don't know. Someone tell me. Uh, so like it or not, internet security practitioners like yourselves are the law and order of the internet. The people in this room are best positioned to build systems that respect and honor the rights of your users, even if the legal structures surrounding them on the internet haven't quite gotten there yet. As forms and methodologies pioneered by private policing forces in the 1800s laid a groundwork for those used by state and federal police forces that were to arrive in the next century, a groundwork that privileged the rights of corporations, that privileged the rights of property owners, and that held damage to property as often more severe than damage to a person. I, I can shout, it's fine. <laughs> or, no, don't like shouting. Oh, no, move the microphone away so you don't get the double echo. Thank you. Okay, we're good now. <laughs> The security norms and practices that are built into the internet at this stage of the game are going to shape the nature of the network to come. And whether or not that is a space that values corporate dictates over individual rights or a space that intentionally places people over profitability is, frankly, up to all of you. 
And that's it. <laughs> this is the required cat picture. You need to have one in every talk. And now you know. It's a rule of the internet. <laughs> and I would love to talk to you guys about this. I'm really interested in how you see yourselves in the context of a policing framework. I'm interested in how you deal with these responsibilities. Um, this is a fairly early research project. I'm, in, I'm doing what's called reading for my comps right now, which means I have a pile of Marxist labor theory this high that I'm reading over the course of the next year. Um, and I'm starting to build my dissertation research. So I'd love to talk to you guys about this, and I'm really interested in the questions you have through about this observation and these theories. I have a comment. It's not true that there wasn't a federal law enforcement service in the U.S. The U.S. Marshal Service has existed since 1789. Yeah, there was a Marshal Service, but those were deployed from a central area. They were deployed in search of high-profile cases. They weren't going to be deployed in order to help the cattlemen enforce their property rights. In the territories, they're the leading law enforcement. Until the territory becomes a state, they were the leading law enforcement agency. Yeah, but they were simply too far scattered to actually have an impact beyond like trying to chase down people who were robbing trains. And in fact, the Pinkertons were also ma a major force in tracking down the major train robbing gangs. <coughs> they were the first people to really engage in infiltration and surveillance as a form of crime fighting. Um, they infiltrated the Jesse James gang to various levels of success. Um, they like yes, there were federal law enforcement agencies in the form of the Rangers, but there were just not enough of them. And the territory that they were supposed to be going over was just too big. <coughs> so maybe I should have said it wasn't effective. But I will quibble with that. About five years ago, there was a lot of discussion about attack back. Yeah. That corporations once identified the culprit should attack back in kind. And that sort of fizzled out because of the of possibility of escalation. How does that affect what you're talking about, this whole idea of attack back? I mean, today corporations are more or less in the protection mode. They want to protect themselves, but they're not attacking back. So there are a couple of things I find interesting about attack back. One is that in my research on DDoS, I actually found a couple of instances where groups like the Pentagon did hack back. And there was one involving a group called the Electronic Disturbance Theater, which was using a Java tool back in the 90s. And the Pentagon unleashed a a hack back a tool on their attack server. And this caused a lot of controversy because not only was this an early hack back, but it was a hack back by a military organization against US civilian based activism. And so there were a couple of very interesting articles and sort of actually Senate testimony about that particular incident. Something that I find troubling is the rapid conflation of a US national security agenda with a corporate cybersecurity agenda. And I'm talking about the co-optation of the Sony hack in this context um, by the current administration to justify certain cybersecurity legislative packages that they're trying to pass. Um, I'm talking about the use of corporate espionage as a defensive priority by the DOD. Um, and so I don't think it's accurate that hackback is necessarily fading into the background. What I think is happening is that hackback is getting co-opted into a military agenda. And it's being co-opted into a military agenda because of the co-optation of corporate security agendas into a military agenda. So. And how do you separate the, the corporate agenda from the overall country's economy. I mean, we, you admit right at the start of your talk that there's a lot of money wrapped up yep. uh, in the internet. And so arguably, distraction or or any sort of interruption to the general economy of the internet is going to affect the economy of the country. But it's not a military priority to necessarily protect corporate profit making. This is something that is debated in sort of, oops. Okay. We lost that. Everyone's fine. Okay. <laughs> this is something that's debated. How much should protection of the economy be a national security priority, and how much of that national security priority should be then transferred to the military? And as far as I'm concerned, in my personal political philosophy, it shouldn't be a military priority. Now, this is something that reasonable people can shout at each other about on the internet. Sure. So, from yeah, from my personal perspective, I think that. National security is one thing, economic protection, and frankly, economic protectionism is a different, is a different issue. So how, so how about uh, internet as infrastructure, you think, no? 
I think that there are parts of the network that are infrastructure. I think that those parts of the network should be air gapped and <laughs> kept away from like Live Journal. <laughs> in fairness, everything. Everything should be kept away from Live Journal. <laughs> but the in in that way, it's almost like there's lazy infrastructure construction being used as a defensive excuse. Oh yeah, well, so, the infrastructure was built what? I mean, thirty years ago. Yeah. And I don't, it's, it, it sort of leaves me sitting in a corner of being like, I don't care how poorly you did your job 30 years ago, and you can't use this as an excuse to co-op people's rights. So, uh, yeah. uh, the range wars ended partly because there was actually a overarching authority with clear jurisdiction over the area, the U.S. government. There was at the end of the range wars, yes. I don't see that happening on the internet. Um, the systems I'm responsible for, I see attacks from all kinds of different countries mm -hmm. every day. Um, I, I, there, there, there's no jurisdictional, uh, there's no group that has jurisdiction over the whole internet, so the U.S. tries to play it sometimes. Um, and as long as the whole thing's connected together, I don't honestly see how we can get a clear legal framework across what's acceptable and some kind of law enforcement on the internet because there are different countries. With different agendas and different standards. Yeah, there is certainly a huge known. jurisdictional problem at the moment. <laughs> Call me incredibly optimistic, but I think that means there's a huge jurisdictional problem at the moment. I don't necessarily think it means there will always be a huge jurisdictional problem. <laughs> and I worry when the solution to the we don't have a clear solution to jurisdiction is how about we pretend that basic human rights don't exist here. Yeah. Which is what I see happening. Yeah. Well, that's the attack back thing. The big problem there is attribution. If you see an oh, attack, yeah. you see an attack coming from China, you don't know if it's Chinese. Yeah. You don't know if it's a uh, hospital in China that's attacked by Russians or whatever. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, I think that's one of the basic objections to hack back in general. Uh, when you talk about wanting to ensure basic human rights on the internet, could you just name what those are? Like what general principles? What what are those rights that should be protected? I think the UN has done a good job on that, on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so speech, affiliation, religion. Um, and even if we're just talking about US-based rights, we have certain expectations for what people are, quote unquote, allowed to do in terms of political activism. And sometimes these political actions are disruptive. And sometimes these political actions make it harder for corporations to function. That doesn't mean they should be treated as fraud and saddled with $200,000 worth of restitution payments to the Koch brothers, like what happened to a gentleman who was involved in an anonymous-led DDoS action against the Koch brothers' corporate website. It's like, participate in a protest for 15 minutes, be in crippling debt for the rest of your life. If people have their hands raised in the side room, I can't really see you that well. Um, uh, so uh, you you mentioned that uh, maybe IT security practitioners have some, uh, let's say, power in this area. And I suspect that's not as true as maybe we would like it to be, that uh, most people I encounter in IT security are understaffed. They have you know, goals they can't meet right, in terms of defense of their organizational assets. And so uh, they are not in a position to exert sort of... Uh, political power in their organization, let alone in the broader internet. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is little choices matter. <coughs> little things, little infrastructural choices, little procedural choices, they have an impact. A choice you make now is going to get magnified because it's going to get repeated. Um, and mostly what, if you take anything away from this talk, I would like, what I would like you to take away from this talk is that Rights, human rights on the internet are not something that is natural because of how the network's been constructed. It's just like, it's just, they're not natural. They're not built in at a, at a, at a, at a hardware level. That's a problem. It's a problem as we start to look at the internet as extremely central to life. It's a, it's a problem as we attempt to deal with issues of network literacy and technology access. If our goal sort of as technologists is to say, the internet and network technology is a great thing. It makes people's lives better. I want everyone in the world to have access to this technology. I really hope that I'm not roping them into a environment where they don't have guaranteed rights and guaranteed privileges of humanity. 
I don't want them to be coming into an environment where if they are being viciously attacked by a horde of people, the answer is, we can't solve that problem. Rape threats are too hard for Twitter. Like, I don't want that to be the answer. It seems like a cop-out, and it seems like <coughs> protectionism to me. So that's what I want you, you guys to take away from this talk, is that the little choices that you make, and even the big choices that you make, especially the big choices you make, are really having an impact on how people live their lives on these platforms. And I'm pretty sure this is stuff you guys already know. But defense rights are something that need to actually have a stake planted for them. We can't just assume that they're there. There's a guy in the back. Do you, do you have a suggestion on how to make the internet more like a public park than like a mall? People ask me this all the time. And no, I don't. Because I'm busy reading my giant pile of Marxist labor theory. <laughs> Like, this is why I come to you guys instead of going to ICA, which is like the major comm studies conference. It's why when I get the opportunity to go talk to people, I'd much rather talk to you than a bunch of other academics who are going to nod sagely and be like, oh yes, corporate rights, oh yes, corporate personhood, this is all very terrible, I have to go teach my comms 101 class now. It's like, you guys actually have the knowledge and experience to do something. And I don't necessarily know what that is because I'm not a technologist. So and the, the best answer I can give you that is I have faith in you. <laughs> so, so help me with this idea of corporate protectionism. It's corporate protectionism when other countries don't necessarily make the same assumptions. Case in point, China, where you actually see not just corporate protectionism, but the government going out and intentionally getting information or stealing data to specifically further their private business. Yeah, no, there are lots of problems where you are in a major player arena and not everyone is playing by the same rules. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get down in the mud with them. Um, like China also engages in mass scale censorship of their social media and they haven't, I think they've tried to deploy a national real name policy recently. Like, just because, like, if, if China ran off a cliff, would you jump off the cliff too? <laughs> Like China is jumping off the cliff. I see something chasing them. I might go with them. <laughs> is something chasing China off the cliff? I don't know. It's a metaphor. So in the metaphor, if are we are, are we going to bring in the Russian bear? The Russian bear is chasing China off the cliff. <laughs> you just have to run faster than China then. <laughs> the internet to either a mall or a public space like a park. Yeah. Isn't it more like a city where when you're on a street, you have certain rights, but when you step into a building, it's very, you're, you're then working in whatever rules are there, like that building may be a mall, right? So Facebook What would the street be? The street would be the actual infrastructure that handles. But what can you do there? What can most people do there? Walk up your place. Yeah. But who's going to be there? So this is the problem. So there are a couple of different theories of, free sp of the First Amendment that say that the First Amendment includes in it a implied right to be heard as well as a right to speech. Standing in a corner by yourself screaming about whatever it is isn't a particularly effective form of public, of public interaction. So the First Amendment actually doesn't say you have the right to free speech. The First Amendment says that Congress shall not, ab shall not abridge the freedom of the press. And the press is an inher inherently communicative medium. This is about pamphleteering. This is about printing things. This is about taking an opinion and pushing it out into the world. This isn't just about saying, well, you know, it's Twitter, so I can say whatever I want because I have freedom of speech. Which I used to work at a social networking website in consumer management, and we would get so many people saying, freedom of speech means I can put pictures of my penis on your server. And be like, that's not what that means. <laughs> <laughs> also, please stop. <laughs> so the question of, this is actually a very interesting legal theory question. Does the ability to speak actually fulfill the political promise of the First Amendment? And there are many legal theorists who would say, no, it doesn't. It, that's, not, that's not what that's intended to do. This is sort of like going into a heavy analysis of the Second Amendment and saying, is a well-regulated militia my cabinet of guns, which I don't have. But, so this is an interesting question. And what I argue in my book is that 
that isn't enough. It's not enough to simply be able to set up a website that no one's going to go to and have my political screed on it. There's something about disruptive activism particularly and forced encounters with dissent that strengthens democracy. And that this is part of, this is encapsulated in the First Amendment. So it's not only that you have the right to speak, but also that democracy is strengthened by people forcibly encountering opinions that they do not share and which they may find offensive. And so the question of, isn't the internet more like a city, aside from not wanting to get into a, isn't the internet more like this metaphor battle? <laughs> um, no, I don't think it is. <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> uh, people who haven't spoken yet. Um, Blue, blue shirt. So I, I sort of have a uh, bit of a two-part question, I think. I know we're not going to get into that sort of battle, but if if you're comparing the internet, or I guess public the mall versus public park, um, if I'm on Best Buy's website, you know, that would be the comparison as if I'm in a Best Buy store. Yeah. You know, so I think there is some stretch as to what you can say in terms of freedom of speech on those particular websites. Um, I guess my question is, do you believe that people, you know, it's, it's the corporation being um, unethical when they put up, you know, service, terms of service, terms, you know, service agreements, and the consumers neglect to accept the, or read through the agreements before they accept them? Do you think that's the, the corporation being unethical? Interesting. So I'm actually about to start a, another project about um, sort of the theory of contract law within structures of power. Because contract law is now how we interact with the world. It didn't used to be. It used to be a fairly special case scenario where you would be, where you would sign a contract with someone and you would have a lawyer and the lawyer would tell you what you were signing, hopefully. And then you, each party would understand what the agreement was that they were getting into. The click wrap and contracts of adhesion that we have now are primarily a liability dodge. They're primarily a way for a corporation to limit their liability by saying, we have no liability. Haha, you signed this. We have no liability. And this is a huge problem. This is why we don't have code liability. Because of these very complicated usage agreements that we are signing. This is why it's very difficult to get a company to admit to a security breach unless they are in California. Like, this is what, this is exactly why. So, I, yeah, I guess I would say that I actually think that most TOSs and the way that they're deployed are pretty unethical because there's never, I don't think that you can make a good faith assumption that the people entering into that agreement have an understanding of the agreement that they're entering into. If people want to know more about these types of contracts and tort reform, I highly recommend a documentary called Hot Coffee, which is about the McDonald's hot coffee case and the rise of tort reform legislation after that case. It's a great documentary and will probably make you really angry. Most of my favorite documentaries make you really angry. <laughs> uh, yeah. But also, like at the same time, I just got a test fiber. I read every single one of those comments. You're very special. <laughs> I will make you a pile of cookies it's for scary. reading all of it. Yeah, it should scare you. I accept it. But the thing is, you have no choice. Yeah, you don't have a choice. Like, you can use, I mean, everybody who touches this phone has all my data. Yeah, basically. There's nothing I can do. I'm happy you you, you understand that. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying that as IT specialists, we have little decisions that we can make that may influence things, and for the rare chance that we actually get to influence policy, let's say for example we have a decision to either protect privacy or or allow you know access. To that. Now, in the case where someone's you know speaking out against the press government and their rights are being you know, taken away, that's a great thing, but if they're distributing child porn or protecting their anonymity, it's not such a great thing. So where do you stand on the sense that you, know, you have to make that decision as an IT specialist? We're not maybe qualified to make those decisions on a social, political. So this is usually the thing. It's sort of the question of, well, we can have free speech, but then you have child porn. And like, this is, this is why the dark net is bad. Um, and I think that that is a way of no offense, but I think that that's a way of ducking personal responsibility. I think that you're selling yourself short and your ability to actually make moral judgments. I actually think that you could probably make that moral judgment if it was presented in front of you. Sure, but we may not have that control being IT and not the CIO or the CT. This is also where things like whistleblowing come in. Like, you have more options than clicking yes or no. 
And that's up to you. And the question is, how willing are you to think seriously about these problems and make them your responsibility as opposed to saying, well, I'm not C-suite, so I can't make these decisions. Um, I kind of like the city analogy. I just heard it for the first time. Um, I kind of see the streets issue as uh, net neutrality. And when you talk about, you know, what happens when you get into a given website and, you know, what is allowed as far as censorship, censorship goes, we have um, government saying that the public still has rights within private property. That's what the Civil Rights Act was all about. Yeah. So, like, I think that is that is a useful analogy because, you know, there's a question of, um, you know, the public's access and speed of access to different websites and the rights that they have when they get into different websites. But you don't have free speech rights on private property. You have the free speech rights that the owner of that private property wants to give you. This is why I don't have to let someone who's sticking lawn signs for a political candidate I don't like stick those lawn signs on my lawn. But there's no reason why um, regulation about websites have to mirror exactly regulation about like you know physical public property. Except for the fact that this is where everything is moving. Like this is where all these activities are going. <laughs> And you can sort of see this assumption in the anger that will surface whenever something pops up like, oh, Facebook doesn't like breastfeeding pictures. People are like, what? They're like, no, they violate our terms of service. Why? They just do. Like, aren't you horrified by breastfeeding pictures? I am. But like, and then every, and everyone goes, it's like WTF. That's the weirdest thing for you to get hung up on. But then these also pop up where you have, so that's, that's the funny, tragic example. Let's take the minority political group who's using Facebook as an organizing platform because that's where the people are. And this happens a lot with foreign groups. Like in, in places like Malaysia, people are on Facebook and they don't really have other platforms or access to other platforms that have the network effects that Facebook does. So they'll have organized campaigns on Facebook. And if those people are relying on Facebook to support implicitly their political speech rights by giving support to this, to this platform, then yeah, those free speech rights really matter. And the respect for those free speech rights really matter. And if we are holding up the internet as a way to enable people who may not have access to these rights in other IRL jurisdictions, then we need to take those rights very seriously. And not just say, well, it's the internet, everyone knows the internet's not real. As for a lot of people, the internet is very real. I was at a conference recently where someone presented a paper about how Tumblr and the internet blog community in general should be viewed as an extension of identity for trans adolescents. And people who are, are interested in the news cycles that I'm interested in have heard that there have been a really tragic wave of trans adolescent suicides who don't have access to communities of support that they need but often they do find them on Tumblr. Often they find them on Twitter. And so the question is, how much are we willing to accept that, for us, the internet may be something that like, I can go on vacation and be happy about not having access to the inter internet for two weeks, but for some people it really is one of the only outlets for their identity that they can access. Lady right there. Yeah. Um, how do you see this personal responsibility rolling out on the internet in like 20, 30 years. Do you see a government sponsored public database of thumbprints or biometric readings? I hope not. No, no. <laughs> let, let me continue here. If there is some way of basically you can get online and talk, but there has to be a record. You are this person, but companies can't send you diaper advertisements because you once talked about someone, a friend of yours having a baby. You don't want that sort of interference that they could figure out that you're you. Mm -hmm. But remember, when we walked into here, we had to give government ID. Did we? I just had to sign a piece of paper. We, we all had to show our driver's license. I did. Yeah. I knew someone knew who I was, so I didn't have to, to flash my passport. Yeah, but um, you see that sort of thing maybe happening just for 
the per you say personal responsibility, but if how can there be personal responsibility if there isn't some kind of overlying? So two things. I don't believe that anonymity means you can't have personal responsibility. I'm a very big believer and proponent of anonymous speech, particularly anonymous political speech. Me too. But, you know, who knows how it's going to fall out in the future. Yeah, it, in, it, in, yes, I could see a dystopian future where we have not only a real name system on the internet, but also sort of a real thumbprint, real ID system. Yes, that would make me super sad, and I, I would be upset. Um, I think that you're pushing the personal responsibility thing that, that you're interpreting for my talk a little far towards the government accountability side. I don't think that, that accountability, social accountability, or interpersonal accountability necessarily implies government accountability, like accountability to a government. I don't believe that that's necessary. Yeah, public, public and social accountability is different than accountability to a census or accountability to a legal structure. And I don't think that they imply each other. And so I think you can have one without recourse to always providing your, you know, your registration number every time you want to log in. I don't know. I have, apparently I have 30 or 40 years to think of that. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so the lady in the back. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that the TOSs don't deal with just websites. We already signed a TOS to get on Wi-Fi. Yeah. So we're talking about even getting on the internet, we're already in a corporate space. There's no public space at all. So I, I just want to bring that up because everyone's saying, oh, this website or that website. Yeah, and it's we it's everywhere. Get yeah, and sort of this is my point about how contract law has become the primary law you interact with to deal with the world. It's like it it just snuck up on us that way um, through various things or little choices where we weren't paying attention. Um, I don't think that counted as a question. That we have time for one more question. Um, gentleman in the black shirt. So, this rights versus terms of service thing, do we expect to see any reaction to market pressure? What, I mean, we, we've seen this sort of thing before where, where companies, good or bad, start to loosen up or tighten based on pressure from large you know, millions of users. Do we expect to see that sort of thing here? Well, does anybody remember Diaspora? Yeah. 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 Diaspora was going to be the open Facebook. It was going to be the thing that respected your privacy, but still let you send each other pictures of cats. And no one went there because no one was there. It's a network effects thing. Um, and so actually, this is the problem. We're getting monopolies of these services because of network effects. And so, well, and also, I, I love beating up on Facebook. So Facebook also did that thing where they were going to have elections, and we were going to, as users, we were going to be able to have influence in the governance of Facebook, except they set it up so that a given percentage of users had to participate in the Facebook election in order for the election to be valid. And it turned out that the number of people that translated into was larger than the voting population of the US. So clearly, it was never going to work. And I'm pretty sure they did that on purpose. I'm pretty sure that that was an intentional thing. It's like, how can we have this and not have to have it? <laughs> how about how about we seem really reasonable by saying, oh, you know, I don't, I don't remember what the percentage of the Facebook population was, but it seemed very low. Until you think about how many people are on Facebook, and you realize that trying to organize that many people is is basically impossible, sort of without Facebook. So the question of can we are we going to see a reaction from market pressure? It's it just I think that's just really difficult. I think you, you, the numbers of people you need to organize are so high to see any sort of reaction to defeat these network effects that I don't actually think that that's going to happen. And to end on that really depressing note, <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.